Hi everyone, I'm FlygonHG, and this is the video of my attempt at a hardcore nuzlocke of Pokemon Shield to raise money for Team C's. To see what I define as hardcore nuzlocke rules, check out the description below. But in short, no items in battle, no overleveling past the gym leader's ace before the start of the battle, and we're playing on set mode. About a month ago, two small content creators on YouTube launched a global campaign called Team C's. The goal of Team C's is to raise $30 million by the end of the year to remove 30 million pounds of plastic and trash from oceans, rivers, and lakes. And while these guys have done a great job raising money so far, there's only so much that they can do with their limited tiny reach. So they challenged other content creators to help out and raise money as well. And so, as someone who occasionally drinks water and would like for polar bears not to melt, I decided to take pity on these small content creators, climb down from atop my massive ivory tower, and help out in any way I can. So here we are with the Team C's themed Nuzlocke. But what does that mean? Well, it means that throughout this playthrough, I'll be using Pokemon themed around cleaning up our oceans, rivers, and lakes. That'll mainly be water Pokemon, for obvious reasons, but there will be a few exceptions that I'll highlight, though I think that the reasons for those Pokemon's inclusion should be pretty clear. As you watch this video, there will be an option to donate to Team C's by clicking the button below. So if you're feeling generous, I'd really appreciate it. But if you won't do it for me, do it for this baby seal. His name is Otis. With your help, Otis will be able to swim in a cleaner and safer ocean. To start out, I'll be donating $100 for every death in this run. So now you'll have even more of a reason to root for my failure during this video. So without further ado, let's get started. Actually one more ado, just as a quick reminder before we start, I play with Species Claws, so I'll be able to re-roll encounters until I get a unique encounter, but I can only use one of each unique evolution line. Let's see how it goes. Our journey begins in the humble town of Postwick. Soon after stepping foot outside, I'm greeted by my rival Hop. If you've ever played a Pokemon game and thought, this would be so much better if my rival developed a depression from sucking so much, well then Pokemon Sword and Shield are the Pokemon games for you. After a handful of cutscenes, I meet Hop and his brother the champion Leon outside their massive mansion of a house, and Leon gives me the choice of three starters. I choose the water type Sobel. Despite being shy, Sobel and I have this cute little moment together, marking the start of what is sure to be a beautiful and long-lasting friendship. Just kidding, as soon as I can, I trade Sobel's whiny little ass to my friend Ian, who kindly gives me the real starter of our run, a Galarian Corsola. I mean, it's too perfect. A Galarian Corsola for the Team Seas challenge? Did you know that we killed the Great Barrier Reef, and then Nintendo made a regional variant of Corsola that's just dead? Easily one of the coolest regional variants out there. I name our new Corsola Revenge, because that's what she's going to want for humans literally destroying one of the natural wonders of the world. People suck. Revenge does have her hidden ability here, as well as a few egg moves, because my friend Ian, quote, only has strong Pokemon, whatever that means. So yeah, I don't know. But now that we have Revenge, we can finally start the challenge. And first up is a whole slew of new encounters before the first gym. From Route 2, I catch a Choodle, and I name her Fury. She'll be a great addition to the team with her strong jaw ability. Then we get access to the wild area, which is split into about a dozen different subsections, so I can get one Pokemon from each of those subsections. It does require changing the date on my Switch, until I get the right weather conditions in each subsection for the water-type Pokemon to actually come out. Determining which Pokemon is the first Pokemon I encounter is a little wonky in Sword and Shield since there are overworld Pokemon, but for this challenge it tends not to matter too much since there's usually only one or two eligible encounters anyways, especially with manipulation of the species clause. So from Dappled Grove, I catch a Lotad and I name him Scorn. Then at West Lake Axwell, I fish up a Magikarp and name her Rage. At East Lake Axwell, I encounter a Wingle, I name her Wrath. Unfortunately, Wrath has the ability Keen Eye, so when she evolves into Pelipper, she won't have the ability Drizzle, which would have been immensely useful for this playthrough. Oh well. After that, Scorn evolves into Lombre. Unfortunately, it'll still be a little while until I can get a Water Stone to evolve her into a Ludicolo, but at least it won't be as long as it is in Pokemon Emerald. Then I make my way to Motostoke, where I fish for a Barboach. Here's a useless piece of info. Barboach allegedly has a 10% encounter rate in Motostoke, but I spent over half an hour fishing for Pokemon in this fishing spot here, and never got anything but Magikarp and Choodle. Each new encounter that wasn't a Barboach was making me descend deeper and deeper into madness. It was absolute hell. After a while, I decided to scour the internet and see if anyone else was having this incredibly niche issue of not being able to find a Barboach in Motostoke. 
I wasn't very confident, because other than for nuzlocks like this, there is really no reason to fish for Barboach here. It has a much higher encounter rate in several other locations in Galar. But the internet didn't disappoint me. I was able to find at least one other poor bastard who was compromising their mental health looking for a Barboach in Motostoke and coming up empty. For whatever reason, it seems that Barboach don't actually spawn in these main fishing spots here. Instead, you have to go back to this suspicious alleyway and fish for Barboach here. Then a Barboach will spawn. Eventually. Well, that's almost an hour of my life I'll never get back. I tell this story on the off chance that if someone somewhere needs to fish for a Barboach in Motostoke, they won't struggle the same way I did. This information doesn't seem to be recorded on any of the major sites like Cerebi or Bulbapedia, so now you know. Thanks for coming to my TED talk. Anyways, I named the Barboach Chaos, a rather apt name in my opinion. Now it's time to prepare for the first gym battle. After some training, Rage evolves into Gyarados, who is a fairly overpowered Pokemon, but we absolutely need her for this first gym battle, because the first gym is a grass-type gym. And in the Galar region, gym battles take place in giant stadiums where trainers can Dynamax their Pokemon. For those of you who don't know what Dynamax is, after 20 years, Game Freak decided to introduce this brilliant gimmick that asked, what if Pokemon, but bigger? And the result is that a Dynamaxed Pokemon gains more HP and can use incredibly powerful max moves for three turns, making them very difficult to take down without taking immense amounts of damage in return. Unfortunately, using Dynamax against the AI opponents makes most of the battles in this game completely trivial, so I'm going to be banning Dynamax from this run. This of course makes my opponent's Dynamax Pokemon incredibly dangerous. In other words, it makes this challenge, well, challenging, especially if their massive max moves do super effective damage into my Pokemon. So yeah, I'm going to need to use Rage the Gyarados to beat Milo and his Dynamaxing Eldegoss, but after that I'll dump her in the box so I'm not tempted to just Dragon Dance my entire way through this game. After all, Otis does need my money. Milo leads Gossifleur, and I lead Rage. Fortunately, Rage learns Ice Fang, so I'm able to knock out the Gossifleur in one shot. As a note here, you'll see that in Sword and Shield, the EXP share can't be turned off, so ally Pokémon always get the EXP from battle. So it's pretty tedious to get all my Pokémon to the exact level cap. It also means that even if they aren't in battle, they gain EXP during the gym battle. So there will be several times throughout this challenge where a Pokemon levels up mid-battle. So this is just a reminder that that is okay according to my personal rule set, which only sets the level cap for the start of the gym battle. Anyways, Eldegoss comes out last, and Milo gives us our first taste of Dynamaxing. After a cool, but tedious Dynamax animation, Rage uses Protect, the single most important move of this playthrough, because it'll help us stall out our opponent's Dynamax. While Protect doesn't fully stop a max move, it does greatly reduce the damage dealt. So if I protect on the first and the third turn of my opponent's Dynamax, they'll only be able to get off one fully powered max move, which is much more manageable. Eldegoss fired off a max strike on that first turn, which lowered my speed. So on the next turn, I do get outsped and hit by a full powered max overgrowth, which does a good chunk of damage and sets up grassy terrain to boost grass moves. I retaliate with an Ice Fang for a good chunk of health though. Then on Eldegoss's last turn of Dynamax, I use Protect again, and Eldegoss fires off another max overgrowth for just a little bit of damage. Grassy Terrain heals a bit of health on Eldegoss, but I don't get any recovery since Terrain only affects grounded Pokémon. With that, Eldegoss's Dynamax is over, so she gets small again. On the next turn, she goes for a round for some reason, so we take a small amount of damage. And then we miss an Ice Fang. Crap. Well, on the next turn, Eldegoss hits a Magical Leaf, which leaves Rage with just 2 HP. I guess I grossly miscalculated that because I was obviously at risk to a critical hit, and maybe even a high roll. At least we connect with an Ice Fang, but thanks to the Grassy Terrain recovery, we just barely miss out on the KO. So I switch to Scorn, who gets hit with a round on the switch. Then I go for a knockoff, which doesn't even kill Eldegoss, but she just retaliates with a Lafage. So with one final knockoff, we knock out Eldegoss, winning us the first gym badge. The pacing of these games are a little weird, so even though the first gym leader was at level 20, the next few are pretty much back to back to back without much of a level jump. After depositing Rage the Gyarados for the rest of the playthrough, I make my way to Route 5 where I fish up a Goldeen. The experience from catching the Goldeen is enough to evolve Fury into Dredna, so that's cool. I name the newly caught Goldeen Justice, because that's what we'll be seeking for Otis. Justice actually comes holding a Mystic Water, which is neat, but that's pretty much all she'll be useful for because next up we head to Holberry and fish up an Aracuda. I name him Violence and then immediately replace Justice. Violence is better than Justice anyways. Now it's time to take on the second gym leader, Nessa and her water types. Say what you will about Sword and Shield, but the character designs are freaking awesome. 
Nessa leads Golding, and I lead Scorn, who uses a critical hit fakeout to flinch the Golding. On the next turn, Nessa hits a horn attack, and then I use a Mega Drain to get most of my HP and bring Golding into the red. We repeat the process on the next turn, only this time I don't fully recover to full HP as I suck away Golding's last bit of HP. Second is Aracuda. So I tank a bite, and then I hit a Mega Drain, yet again leaving Nessa's Pokemon in the red and recovering me to a nice amount of HP. On the next turn, Scorn tanks another bite, and then retaliates with another Mega Drain to knock out Aracuda. That means we're at pretty full health for Nessa's Dreadnought that comes out last. Nessa goes for a Dynamax, so I go for a Protect, which lets me easily tank a Max Darkness. I'm worried about being able to survive another Max Darkness on the next turn, so I switch to Fury for a little bit of a Funhouse Mirror match. I'm able to tank the Max Darkness fairly well. Then I go for a Protect on Dreadnought's last turn as it goes for a Max Geyser, which sets up the rain. With Dreadnought's Dynamax up, I'm able to switch back to Scorn, who avoids a Razor Shell. And now with the rain set up, Scorn's Rain Dish ability is in effect, and I'm able to heal a bit of HP. So it's safe to use Fake Out on the next turn to flinch Dreadnought, and then also get some more HP back and then I can use Protect for even more HP recovery. That turns out to be pretty important, because Dreadnought hits a very hard headbutt on the next turn. But since I don't flinch, I can retaliate with a Mega Drain and gain some health back. Then I manage to avoid one more headbutt flinch on the next turn, so a final Mega Drain knocks out Dreadnought, winning us the second gym badge. The only thing to do before taking on the third gym leader is to head into Galar Mine number 2. There I find and catch a Shellos. I name her Damnation. I'm honestly surprised that the game actually let me do that. Then I run into Team Yell, which is the evil team of Galar. Though they really aren't evil so much as they are just incredibly loud and incredibly annoying, they also aren't particularly relevant or difficult to fight. So why am I showing this? Well, let's just say violence may not have been the best choice for this double battle. So yeah, that's, that's the first death of the run, and 100 pounds of trash cleaned up from Otis's backyard. Rest in peace, violence. The rest of this fight is pretty trivial with Fury, so I'll skip it, but the experience from the fight is enough to level up Wrath and evolve him into a Drizzleless Pelipper. Great. Okay, well Justice the Golding is back on the team as we enter Motostoke Stadium to take on the third gym leader, Kabu. He's actually a pretty difficult gym leader, and he has very strong Pokemon for this point in the game. But fortunately, he's a Fire-type gym leader, so this should be pretty easy for our 5-6th Water-type team. Kabu leads Nine Tails, and I lead Fury. Kabu uses Will-O-Wisp to burn Fury, but a Rost Berry heals the burn as I set up a Rock Polish to gain a speed boost. This lets me outspeed the Nine Tails on the next turn, and hit it with a Razor Shell. But unfortunately, that's not quite enough for the kill, so she hits a Fire Spin. But on the next turn, I hit another Razor Shell to knock out the Nine Tails. Next is Arcanine. Thank you for these pronunciation opportunities, Kabu. Arcanine gets off an Intimidate, so a Razor Shell doesn't knock it out, and then it hits a Will-O-Wisp. So now Fury is burned but a Razor Shell is still enough to finish off the Arcanine. But Scorch is next for Kabu, and poses a bit of a problem. Kabu's Scorch can Gigantamax, which is a special type of Dynamax that certain Pokemon can do, which gives their max move special effects. In the case of Scorch, its Fire-type max move becomes G-Max Centiferno, which creates a Fire Spin on my Pokemon, meaning that it'll trap me in so that I can't switch, and I really don't want to be trapped in with a Burnt Dreadnought. Now, there's no reason for Scorch to go for a resisted Fire-type move against Fury when it can just go for a non-resisted Bug move, but the AI seems to be kind of weird and unpredictable about which Dynamax moves they choose to use. And they do seem to like using their signature moves, even if it doesn't make much sense. So, to be safe, I switch to Wrath. But Scorch does end up using Max Flutterby, so it would have been safe to stay in with Fury. On the next turn, I protect with Wrath and get hit by another Max Flutterby which doesn't do too much damage, but does lower my special attack by two stages. So now it's not safe to stay in and get trapped with Wrath either. So I switch to Revenge, who gets hit by a G-Max Scent Inferno. So now Revenge is trapped in with a Fire Spin as Scent Scorch's G-Max ends. But there's nothing I can do besides hope that Revenge can tank a hit and kill with an Ancient Power. Fortunately, Scent Scorch just goes for Smokescreen, so Revenge is able to retaliate with an Ancient Power. Unfortunately, it's not enough for the kill but I'm still trapped by Fire Spin, so I just gotta survive one more turn and hit an Ancient Power. Scorch goes for Flame Wheel, but sadly it's enough to knock out Revenge. Humanity killed the Great Barrier Reef, and I killed Revenge the Corsola. I'm so sorry, buddy. The truly sad thing about all of this, which I'm sure people have already eagerly typed out in the comments, is that in later generations, Ghost-type Pokémon actually can't be trapped by moves like Fire Spin. 
so I easily could have switched Revenge out for any of my other Water-type Pokémon. I just forgot about that particular game mechanic in the moment, and I paid the price. Well, after Wrath comes out to finish off the Senescorch, Kabu gives us the third gym badge, and from there, the wild area opens up quite a bit and our level cap increases enough to be able to get a bunch more encounters. First, in South Lake Milosh, I catch a Corefish and I name her Vengeance, which apparently I spelled wrong. Didn't actually know that that's how you spelled Vengeance until Google Docs auto-corrected this script while I was writing it. Whoops. Then, in North Lake Milosh, I fish up a Basculin and name him Spite. Then, from Motostoke Riverbank, I catch a Mariani. I name her Retribution. Next up is a Timpole named Pain from Watchtower Ruins. Then I head to Hammerlock Hills to catch a Wimpod named Armageddon. Then I go to Bridge Field and find a Cramorant. But I end up accidentally killing the Cramorant. So that's that. In Bridge Field, I pick up a Water Stone, so I use it to evolve Scorn into Ludicolo. Then I go to the Giant's Mirror and fish up a Chinchow. I name him Retaliation. Then I head to the Stony Wilderness to take a crack at catching a Cramorant again. Cramorants are just so derpy that I just gotta use one. Fortunately, this time, the catch is a success. So welcome to the team, Hellfire. My final wild area encounter for now is a Shelter that I fish up in the giant seat. I name him Condemption. Yeah, so apparently that's not how you say condemnation. I didn't realize that until I already recorded the hour-long audio for this video, so I'm gonna make that mistake a lot. Sorry. And lastly, before continuing to Hammerlock, I backtrack to Motostoke Outskirts and catch a Coughing. You might be thinking that's a weird Pokémon to catch in a challenge themed around cleaning up pollution, but I'll explain why in a second. I name her Fred. Going forward, I make some pretty major roster changes. Fury the Dreadnought and Scorn the Ludicolo stay on, but I replace everyone else with Hellfire the Cramorant, Vengeance the Corefish, Fred the Coughing, and Pain the Temple, who evolves into a Palpitoad. After doing some story stuff in Hammerlock, I have to fight Hop. I've been skipping all the fights with Hop because he is very, very bad. So bad that he manages to lose to the other rival in this game, who I haven't even mentioned yet, and it's definitely not because I have no idea how to say his name. Anyways, we'll be skipping this fight with Hop too, but someone should probably keep an eye on him. He's clearly not doing too well. Obliterating Hop's Pokémon does give me enough EXP to evolve Fred into a Galarian Weezing. Galarian Weezing is pretty cool because according to the in-game text, it changed into its Galarian form as a result of too much air pollution. Now in its Galarian form, Weezing is able to consume pollutants and fart clean air. That is literally what it says in the Pokedex, so it seemed pretty fitting for the Team C's challenge. Anyway, soon after this, Pain evolves into Seismitoad, and Vengeance evolves into Crawdon. So now our team is looking pretty strong, which is good because these next few gym leaders are fought back to back to back, and they have some pretty scary Pokémon, including one apiece that will Gigantamax. First up is Alistair, the Ghost-type gym leader. He's got a tricky team, including a Mimikyu that can't be one-shot thanks to its ability, and a Gigantamax Gengar that will trap you in with G-Max Terror. Alistair is so much harder than his sword counterpart B, but at least he leads with a Wimpy Yam Mask, so I lead Scorn and instantly knock it out with the Scald. Then Mimikyu comes out. It hits a pretty hard slash as I break its disguise with the Scald. Sadly, I don't get the burn. Then I switch to Fred as Mimikyu goes for a Hone Claws. Then Mimikyu goes for a Baby Doll Eyes for some reason, and I hit it with a Will-O-Wisp. Then I switch to Vengeance as Mimikyu goes for another Hone Claws. This is getting a little dangerous, but I do have a plan. Mimikyu uses another Hone Claws as I go for a Taunt. Then I switch to Fury, who gets hit by a very weak Slash. Then Mimikyu uses Shadow Sneak as I use Rock Polish to increase my speed. On the next turn, Mimikyu outspeeds with a Priority Shadow Sneak, and then I just finish it off with a Liquidation. Third for Alistair is Cursula, so I just knock it out with a Crunch, which is boosted by our Strong Jaw ability. Last is Alistar's Gengar. He Dynamaxes it into its terrifying Gigantamax form and goes for a G-Max Terror, as I use Protect. It still does a good chunk of damage, and now I'm trapped in. Rock Polish means I outspeed, but I'm really not sure if I can one-shot his Gengar. With a max Dynamax level, Dynamax doubles the Pokémon's HP. If Alistar has maxed out his Gengar's Dynamax level, Crunch won't kill. But if he didn't, and he's only at the base Dynamax level, which gives you 1.5 times HP, it should kill. I have no idea what his Dynamax level is, so there's only one way to find out. Fury goes for a crunch, and she gets the one shot, winning us the fourth gym badge in spectacular fashion. After a quick trip through Glimwood Tangle, we end up in Balanlia, where it's time to fight the fifth gym leader, Opal. She's pretty easy because she asks me questions during the fight, and if I answer those questions correctly, I get a bunch of stat boosts. 
So she leads her Galarian Weezing, and I lead Pain. I start with a Gastro Acid to get rid of Weezing's Levitate ability, as it uses a weak Fairy Wind. Then I answer a question correctly and get a free speed boost. Not that that really matters. I hit Weezing with a Bulldoze on the next turn, as it just uses another weak Fairy Wind. So a second Bulldoze knocks it out on the next turn. Then Opal brings out Mawile. It has Intimidate, so it manages to survive a Bulldoze. But then it just retaliates with a really weak Crunch, although it does get the Defense drop. But then answering another one of Opal's questions correctly boosts my defense and special defense. So I kill the Mawile with another Bulldoze. And then Togekiss comes out. So I switch to Fred, who gets hit really hard by an Air Slash. Yikes. I decide to risk a crit here, and I go unpunished as I get hit by another Air Slash, and then hit Togekiss with a hard Sludge Bomb. Then I switch to Fury, who tanks an Air Slash. Opal asks me another question, and my kiss-ass answer is enough to get me boosts to my attack and special attack. So then I outspeed and knock out the Togekiss with a liquidation. Last for Opal is All Creamy. Opal Gigantamaxes All Creamy into like a giant wedding cake, I guess. And then I hit it with a liquidation. All Creamy retaliates with the G-Max Finale, which easily would have killed me if it crit, but she doesn't get that crit. The G-Max Finale does heal her up a bit, but it's not enough to stop me from finishing it off with another liquidation. That wins us the 5th Gym Badge. Next up is the 6th Gym Leader Melanie and her Ice Types. But before that, I decide to replace Hellfire the Cramorant with Condemption the Shelter, who evolves into a Cloister with a Water Stone that I got from the Digging Duo. While training Condemption, Retaliation the Chinchow evolves into Lantern. Not that that matters. For now. Okay, time for Melanie. She leads Frostmoth, and here's why I brought Condemption onto the team. Condemption has the ability Skill Link, which means her multi-hit moves always hit 5 times. So this lets her get off a 125 base power Rock Blast, which will almost never miss when she holds a Wide Lens. It just demolishes Melanie's Frostmoth. And then Darmanitan comes out. It uses Taunt for some reason, and then we get 5 hits off with Rock Blast. But because Condemption is not exactly the most physically strong Pokemon, Darmanitan is able to hold on into the red. And then it changes into its Zen Mode form, which I don't think I've ever actually seen. It means that Melanie's Darmanitan has its hidden ability. It also means that it's able to fire off a pretty hard Fire Fang, but then we take it out with a Rock Blast. Third is Ice Q, who has a pesky Ice Face ability, but fortunately Rock Blast breaks it on the first hit. Unfortunately, the remaining four Rock Blasts aren't enough for the kill, so she retaliates with an Icy Wind. And now that Ice Q is in her Noise form, she outspeeds Condemption and hits a really hard Freeze Dry. Again, thankfully it didn't crit. I'm getting pretty lucky. Another Rock Blast knocks out the Ice Q. And then last is Melanie's Gigantamax Lepra. Again, much scarier than the Sword Equivalent Gigantamax Colossal. I switch to Crawdont as Melanie Gigantamaxes her Lepra. She hits Crawdont with a massive Max Geyser, which sets up the rain. Then I switch to Scorn, who gets hit by another Max Geyser, which does just a sliver of damage as I recover some HP with Rain Dish. Then I go for an Energy Ball for a huge chunk of damage as Lepra fires off a G-Max Resonance, which sets up Reflect and Light Screen on her side of the field, as well as doing decent damage to Scorn. But now her Dynamax is over, so I use a Giga Drain to gain some HP back, and then tank an Icy Wind. On the next turn, Lepra outspeeds to hit an Ice Beam, and I hit another Giga Drain, bringing Lepra into the red. So I bring in Fury to finish off Lepra. But then it goes for a Sing? Okay, so I switch back to Scorn, who gets hit with an Icy Wind. Okay, well I use Fake Out here, because why not, but that obviously doesn't kill it, so I switch to Pain. Fortunately, Lepra misses a Sing here, so Pain is able to use Drain Punch to knock out Lepra on the next turn. That gets us the 6th Gym Badge. After this, I can head to Route 9, where I'm given the extension to my Rotom bike that lets me travel across water, which means I can get a bunch of new encounters. There's a lot of really cool encounters on Route 9, but unfortunately the one I see first is a Remoraid, so that's what I get. I name him Ruin. Then I head back to the wild area to get some water encounters that were previously inaccessible. I go to the Dusty Bowl intending to catch a Frillish in the pond, but on the way I run into a Cub Chew. And I mean, you gotta catch a Polar Bear Pokemon for the Team C's challenge, right? I name him War, and he goes into the box. Then from Lake Outrage, I catch a Mantike and name her Apocalypse. From the Giant's Cap, I catch a Krabby and name her Torment. And from Axew's Eye, I fish up a Wishiwashi and name her Doom. Finally, I backtrack to Route 6 and revive the derpy abomination that is Dracovish. I name it Suffering. None of these guys join the team though, I'm pretty content with the group of 6 that we have for now. Okay, time for the 7th Gym Leader, Pierce and his Dark Types. Pierce doesn't Dynamax, so this shouldn't be too difficult. He leads Scrafty, and I lead Fred. 
Scrafty has its hidden ability, so it gets an Intimidate off, but it doesn't really matter. He also uses Fake Out on the first turn, so we flinch. But then on the next turn, we hit it with a Strain Steam for the one-shot. Malamar comes out next, so I switch to Crawdont, who is immune to his Psycho Cut. On the next turn, Malamar manages to hit a pretty nasty foul play, but then a 4 times effective X Scissors is enough for the kill. Third is Obstagoon. Obstagoon uses Throat Shot, and then Vengeance retaliates with a Brick Break, which despite being 4 times effective, does just over half health. Weird. Well, on the next turn, Obstagoon uses Obstruct, harshly lowering Vengeance's defense, so it's no longer safe to stay in. I switch to Fred, who tanks a Throat Chop, and then on the next turn, Obstagoon stalls with another Obstruct, but it does nothing as we just hit into it with Strange Steam. Then Obstagoon hits a Shadow Claw, which does decent damage because it crits, but then Fred is able to finish it off with a Strange Steam. Last is Skuntank. He goes for a Sucker Punch, which fails because Fred goes for a Will-O-Wisp, which connects and burns Skuntank. Then I hit Skuntank with a Strange Steam, which ends up confusing the Skuntank as well. Skuntank is able to break through and hit a Snarl, but it doesn't do much. So on the next turn, we hit it with a final Strange Steam, which crits, knocking out Skuntank and winning us the 7th Gym Badge. Pretty much immediately after beating the 7th Gym, it's time to fight the 8th Gym. Like I said, the pacing in this game is pretty weird. The 8th Gym Leader is Raihan, who kinda specializes in dragons, but also focuses on using weather strats, so his fight is a double battle. A man after my own heart, he leads Flygon and Gigalith, and then I lead Condemption and Scorn. Gigalith's Sandstream causes a Sandstorm. On the first turn, I use Fake Out into the Gigalith, and then thanks to a Choice Scarf, Condemption outspeeds and knocks out Flygon with an Icicle Spear. After taking some Sandstorm Chip, Raihan brings out Sandaconda. I decide to double up on Sandaconda, in case Condemption doesn't kill with Icicle Spear alone. This ends up being a pretty big mistake. Icicle Spear doesn't kill Sandaconda, so Scald finishes it off, which means that Gigalith is at full health as Raihan's final Pokemon Duraludon comes out. Retrospectively, I think it would have been better to split my damage, tank a hit from Sandaconda and Gigalith, and then kill both Sandaconda and Gigalith on the next turn so that it becomes a 2 on 1 against the Duraludon. Instead, we're dealing with two pretty strong Pokemon at the same time, one of which will Gigantamax, and it's not clear which of my Pokemon each of Raihan's Pokemon will be targeting, so I just gotta guess. I switch Condemption to Pain, and then Raihan Gigantamaxes Duraludon into an absolutely absurd skyscraper looking thing. Duraludon goes for a Max Knuckle, which gives him and Gigalith an attack boost. Very bad. Scorn hits a Scald into Gigalith, and then it retaliates with a Body Press, so at least it isn't taking advantage of that attack boost. On the next turn, I switch Pain into Fred, and then use Protect with Scorn. Raihan uses G-Max Depletion into Fred, which she's immune to, and then Gigalith uses Body Press into Fred as well. So that was a waste of a Protect, but the turn ended up working out pretty well. Thinking that Raihan will now want to use his Steel-type Max move into Fred, I go for a Protect. But unfortunately, he just goes for a Max Knuckle into Scorn, ruthlessly knocking him out and giving both his Pokémon an attack boost. Rest in peace, you cheery little pineapple duck. You will be missed. I bring in Pain, but this is looking pretty bad. I didn't think this through very well, and now I'm dealing with a plus 2 Duraludon that is surprisingly fast for some reason. I'm not really sure what I was thinking here, but I decide to stay in with Fred, so Duraludon just outspeeds and kills her with an Iron Head. I definitely should have switched to Vengeance, who potentially could have survived an Iron Head, but even if he didn't, that would have been much less of a brutal loss. Well, the bright side is that Pain is able to avenge Fred and knock out the Duraludon with an Earth Power, and then he also tanks a Body Press. So after bringing out Fury, I kill the Gigalith with a Liquidation, winning us the 8th and final badge. The victory feels a little hollow though. I was a big fan of Scorn and Fred, and their typings make them pretty hard to replace. But we have to do our best. Enjoy the 200 bucks, Otis. I decide to bring on Retribution the Mariani and Suffering the Dracovish. But after a non-insignificant amount of training, I realize that Dracovish's moveset is absolutely abysmal, especially because Suffering has the ability Water Absorb instead of Strong Jaw. He doesn't even learn Ficious Rend until level 63, and I'm not really in desperate need of a physical water type move. I really wanted to use him, but he's just not very useful. So instead, I bring on Apocalypse the Mantike, and then with some training, Retribution evolves into Toxapex. Get ready for some Toxic stall, kids. With the help of Ruin the Remoraid, Apocalypse is able to evolve into Mantine, which gives our team a fairly decent special attacker and a very solid special defensive tank. Now it's time for the Elite Four, or Galar's version of the Elite Four. It's called the Championship Cup. Setting the level cap for this part of the game is a little wonky. The Championship Cup starts with a semi-final consisting of two battles, and then it gets interrupted by some story stuff. 
Then the finals consists of four battles, akin to the Elite Four, that are slightly higher leveled than the semi-final fights. I decide to set the level cap to the strongest Pokemon in the finals, which is 55, but because I'd over level before the start of the finals if I got to the level cap of 55 before the semifinals, I sort of just roll into the semifinals at whatever level I happen to be after the fight with Raihan. In the semifinals, I'm first pitted against Marnie, who has been kind of a third rival throughout the game, but honestly the fight against her isn't particularly interesting, and it's also incredibly tedious. We have a lot of other fights to still cover, so I'm just gonna skip her. Based on how my other fights go though, you should be able to intuit the strategy I employed to beat her here without too much of an issue. Let's just hop straight to the final fight of the semifinals, which is against Hop, who finally got his life together and put together a pretty solid team. He starts with Dubwool, who is actually pretty tough for us to take out, since most of my Pokemon are physical attackers. So I lead Choice Specs Apocalypse. After Dubwool uses Cotton Guard, Brian brings it down to just under half health. On the next turn, Dubwool hits a hard Body Slam, but for the first time in the history of Pokemon, Body Slam doesn't paralyze me. So Apocalypse just finishes off the Dubwool with another Brian. This brings out Pinkurchin, so I switch to Pain, who is immune to Thunderbolt, and then I just eviscerate Pinkurchin with an Earth Power. Yes, Hop, I do know about super effective moves. Next is Snorlax, so I hit it with a Drain Punch as it retaliates with a Hammer Arm for a decent chunk of damage. But on the next turn, another Drain Punch knocks out Snorlax and brings Pain back to full health. She's really been carrying a lot of this run, hasn't she? Corviknight is next and no Swagger, so I stay in and go for a soft Drain Punch. Then I get hit by a Scary Face, so I switch to Retribution, who tanks a Drill Peck. Corviknight continues to Drill Peck away as I manage to set up two layers of Toxic Spikes and also use Recover to keep me healthy. It's a little annoying because Corviknight does use Swagger, so I'm not in a safe spot to use Recover and get back to full health. So I just switch to Fury on a Drill Peck. Then I use Rock Polish to outspeed Hop Cinderace in the back, and then Corviknight hits a pretty hard Steel Wing, which gets the defense buff. I was kind of hoping for him to give me a free Swagger boost since I have a Person Berry equipped, but I guess that's not happening. After a few turns of using Liquidation and Corviknight dropping my speed with Scary Face, I'm able to knock out Corviknight but not before it fires off a critical hit Steel Wing. This puts me in a pretty bad position, because now Cinderace is out, I no longer outspeed thanks to Scary Face, and Fury is at pretty low HP. I decide to switch into Retribution as Hop Dynamaxes his Digimon and then goes for a Max Knuckle. Then I use Baneful Bunker to protect myself from a Max Flare. Then I switch to Fury, who even at low health is able to just barely tank a Max Airstream, so now Cinderace's Dynamax is over, and he's already at relatively low health thanks to the Toxic Spikes. I go for a Protect to get more Toxic damage onto Cinderace. With the Sun Up and the Max Knuckle Attack Boost, Pyro Ball is going to hit pretty hard into most of my team, but I trust that Pain can tank the hit. Fortunately, he does as Cinderace loses another chunk of health from Toxic. One more turn of Poison Damage will finish him off. So I switch to Vengeance, confident that she'll be able to tank the hit. But that's when I'm reminded of the ability Blaze, which increases Cinderace's fire type attacks when its HP drops below one third. So with that Blaze boost, it's enough for a devastating one shot, putting an end to Vengeance's life and giving Otis yet another $100. The silver lining is that Cinderace goes down, so the battle is won, but losing another Pokemon to a fire type feels pretty bad. After burying Vengeance, I bring Retaliation the Lantern onto the team. Before the final rounds of the Champion Cup, I do have to fight Oleana and do some other random stuff, but I'll just skip that because we make it out of the fight in one piece, and there's still quite a few more fights to cover before the end of this challenge. So after training everyone up to the level cap of 55 to match Raihan's Duraludon, here's my final team. Despite having some non-water options throughout this playthrough, I guess we ultimately ended up with a monotype water team. Let's see if my fish have what it takes, or if Otis is going to get incredibly wealthy. The first fight of the Champion Cup is a surprise challenge from this guy. Again though, it's a super tedious fight that involves setting up Toxic Spikes with Retribution against his Mawile, and then doing some careful switches to not get murked by his G-Max Hatterene. I'll skip this fight as well and just move on to the first round of the finals, which pits us against Nessa. Water types versus water types. She leads Galissapod and I lead Condemption. I start with a Protect to avoid Galissapod's first impression. Then I go for a Rock Blast. It isn't enough to kill the Galissapod since it's pretty defensively bulky, but it is enough to activate his emergency exit before he can get off an attack. So out comes Seeking, which gives me a perfect opportunity to switch to Retribution and set up Toxic Spikes, and then stall the Seeking to death with Baneful Bunker. I'll do a flash cut here to save us some time, but it ultimately ends with Seeking going down and Retribution at almost full health. Next is Barrascuta. RIP Violence. 
I hope you're swimming peacefully up there in fishy heaven. Barraskewda has Drill Run, so after stalling a turn with Baneful Bunker, I switch to Apocalypse. Then I use Protect to block a Throat Chop and get more Toxic Damage. And then it's back to Retribution. Toxapex is a ridiculously broken Pokemon. Another Baneful Bunker puts Barraskewda in the red, so Nessa is gonna heal. She uses a Full Restore, and then Retribution hits a Venishock for a chunk of damage. Then it's Baneful Bunker to poison the Barraskewda again, though this time it's just regular poison instead of Toxic. Then I switch back to Apocalypse on a Drill Run. Then it's a Protect. And then it's one final switch to Retribution, who brushes off a critical hit Throat Chop. And then Retribution uses Baneful Bunker to finally finish off the Barraskewda. What a terrible way to go out. Next is Pelipper. And Nessa's Pelipper actually does have Drizzle. Must be nice. Pelipper sets up a Tailwind as I use Recover to get back to full HP. Then Pelipper goes for an Air Slash, which causes me to flinch. That's okay though, because on the next turn, he hits another Air Slash, and we flinch again. Okay, well on the third turn, Pelipper uses Air Slash. Well, what do you know? It's a good thing that Toxapex is such a ridiculously good Pokemon, because if this happened against any other Pokemon, it would probably be dead. Well, Tailwind expires now, so Pelipper sets up another one, allowing me to get off another Recover. Then it's back to Serengrace Pelipper Air Slashes. But this time, I manage to get off a few Venishocks, and I even dodge an Air Slash, which lets me recover for free. A few turns later, and Pelipper falls into the red, so it recovers with Roost as I also recover. So on the next turn, I switch to Retaliation as Pelipper sets up another Tailwind. Pelipper goes for a Roost, and I use Eerie Impulse to harshly lower its special attack. Then Pelipper hits a soft Air Slash as I hit another Eerie Impulse. From here, I bring in Condemption, who takes a surprising amount of damage from a minus 4 Air Slash. Then I finish off the Pelipper with a Rock Blast. Just kidding, it survives in the red and sets up another Tailwind. Well, fortunately, Pelipper just heals with Roost. Unfortunately, Roost removes his Flying type, so Rock Blast doesn't hit for super effective damage. However, it still does just enough for Pelipper to want to just repeatedly heal with Roost and he does that until Tailwind expires. So on the next turn, we're able to outspeed and knock him out. I sort of forgot about Galissapod, who ends up coming out next, but we just protect to avoid damage from first impression, and then we finish it off with another Rock Blast. That just leaves Dreadnaw, which is why I bent over backwards to beat Pelipper with Condemption, instead of just sniping it with an electric move from Retaliation. Condemption baits a Rock-type move from Dredna, which lets me switch to Pain as Nessa Dynamaxes and goes for a Max Rockfall. Then I switch to Retribution, who tanks a Max Darkness relatively well. And then a Baneful Bunker protects me from the second Max Darkness. With that, Dredna's Dynamax is over, so on the next turn, I tank a Liquidation, and then heal with Recover. And from here, I just spam Recover until Dredna dies from poison a few turns later. It's not the most noble way to win, but whatever. Before you comment complaining about the Toxic Stall, just remember that this is a playthrough of a children's video game trying to raise money for charity. Anyways, that's Nessa defeated, and we move on to the next round of the Champion Cup. Next up is Alistair, but I've got a pretty foolproof strategy for this one. He leads Dust Noir, and I lead Retribution. Dust Noir knows Thunder Punch, but Retribution is just too bulky. I'm able to easily poison the Dust Noir and set up Toxic Spikes while still staying healthy. We can skip a few turns here. Eventually, I switch to Pain on a Thunder Punch, and then on the next turn, I kill Dust Noir with a Liquidation. This baits out Poltegeist, who knows Giga Drain. So I switch to Apocalypse, who tanks it well enough. Then I go for a Choice Specs Boosted Surf. Poltegeist does hit us with a pretty hard Shadow Ball, but on the next turn, it goes down to another Surf. Next up is Cursola. I switch to Retribution as Cursola goes for Amnesia. Then I use Eerie Impulse to lower its special attack, as Cursola uses Strength Sap to stay healthy. I go for another Eerie Impulse as Cursola just uses Strength Sap again. Then I switch to Fury, who gets hit by a Soft Hex. From here, I set up a Rock Polish as Cursola uses Amnesia. Then I start setting up Sword Stances. Cursola uses Strength Sap every now and then, but the Sword Stance attack boosts outpace the few Strength Sap attack drops, so eventually I'm looking at plus 6 attack. Then I just kill the Cursola with a Crunch. Getting to plus 6 might seem like overkill, but Chandelure comes out next and I wanted to make sure that I was still plenty strong even if Sandalure's Flame Body activated on contact. It doesn't though, so after Chandelure goes down to a crunch, Alistair brings out Gengar. He Gigantamaxes Gengar, only for Fury to outspeed and knock it out in one shot with a crunch. Poor, poor Alistair. With that, we're on to the final round of the Champion Cup, which is a rematch against Raihan. Last time he killed two of my Pokemon, but this time I'm ready for him. Also, because I can't turn off the EXP share, my Pokemon have a few levels on his after the first few rounds of the Champion Cup, but again, the level cap only applies until the start of the Elite Four, or the Championship Cup in this case, so it's fine. 
Anyways, Raihan leads Torkoal and I lead Retaliation. Torkoal's Drought sets up the Sun, so I have Retaliation use Rain Dance. This makes Torkoal's Solar Beam take up two turns, so he just sits there absorbing sunlight as we scald his ass for the one-shot. Raihan brings out Flygon, so I switch to Apocalypse to avoid an Earthquake, but he just goes for Sandstorm. Apocalypse has a Choice Scarf though, so we outspeed Flygon and hit an Icy Wind, but Flygon hangs on and fires back a Dragon Claw. Then Raihan uses a Full Restore, so another Icy Wind brings Flygon back into the red. And then another one knocks it out. Good night, sweet prince. Third for Raihan is Gudra, so I switch to Pain, who is immune to a Thunder. Then Pain hits an Ice Punch, which manages to freeze Gudra. So another one on the next turn knocks it out. Fourth is Turtonator, so I hit it with an Earth Power as it goes for a Dragon Pulse, but we tank it pretty well thanks to our Assault Vest. Then I switch to Retaliation as Turtonator sets up a Sunny Day. Turtonator goes for a Shell Trap, but it fails as I hit it with an Eerie Impulse. On the next turn, the same thing happens. And then we do the same dance for a third time. Then I switch to Retribution as Turtonator fails another Shell Trap. I hit Turtonator with a Toxic as it sets up Sunny Day again. On the next turn, I use Baneful Bunker as Turtonator succumbs to Poison. Almost instantly, I realize that this was pretty stupid because Duraludon comes out next and Gigantamaxes. And now I can't protect myself. Fortunately, Retribution takes a Max Rock Fall pretty well, and then I just heal back all my health with Recover. I have Retribution out so that Duraludon isn't tempted to use Max Knuckle and get attack boosts like last time. Thanks to Baneful Bunker and Recover, it's pretty trivial to stall out the last two turns of Duraludon's Dynamax. After that, I switch to Fury, who tanks a Dragon Claw, and gets some HP back with Leftovers. Then I protect for some more Leftovers recovery. Then I go for an Ice Fang, which does a good chunk of damage. But Duraludon retaliates with a pretty strong body press. So I go for a Protect, because might as well, in case the situation gets sticky. Then I switch to Pain, who easily tanks a body press. Duraludon is able to outspeed Pain and almost knock her out with a critical hit Dragon Claw, but Pain survives in the red and retaliates with an Earth Power, putting down Raihan's Duraludon for the last time and winning us the battle. With that, we've won the honor of fighting the champion Leon, but unfortunately, Chairman Rose interrupts the battle to reveal that he needs to bring about the Darkest Day to provide enough energy to Galar for his Bitcoin mining operations or something. I'm not really sure. Par for the course, his evil plan is pretty incoherent and ambiguous, but it does mean that we have to go fight him and put an end to all this British nonsense. Unfortunately, Chairman Rose has a pretty tough team for us to deal with, primarily because of one pesky Pokemon, his Ferrothorn. With Power Whip, Ferrothorn hits four of our six Pokemon for super effective damage. Our other two members either can't actually do that much damage to him, or have paper thin physical defense, which means that a stab boosted Power Whip will still do way too much damage. Ferrothorn also has pretty good defenses and is really difficult to take down quickly unless you have a fire type move, which none of my Pokemon can learn. Escavalier is similarly problematic, but at least it doesn't have a 120 base power stab grass move to throw at us. Oh, also Ferrothorn has Curse, so things can get out of hand really quickly. I really wish Fred was still around to throw out some flamethrowers, but sadly, he's not. The solution I come up with is a blast from the past. After jamming a bunch of EXP candies down her throat, Wrath is back on the team. Hello, old friend. Are you ready for one last ride? I, I mean, one more ride? Definitely not the last ride of your life, that's for sure. Well, Rose leads Escavalier and I lead Apocalypse. Thanks to choice specs, two surfs are enough to take down the cosplaying bug as it just wastes time setting up a sword stance. Second is Kling Clang, who knows Wild Charge, so I switch to Pain, who is now sporting a choice band. Kling Clang outspeeds to hit an Assurance, and then we hit a huge Drain Punch to gain back all of our HP. Kling Clang goes for another Assurance, and then another Drain Punch knocks it out. Third is the problematic Ferrothorn. So now it's time to enact our plan. I switch to Wrath, who takes big damage from Power Whip on the switch. But a Citrus Berry means that she'll survive another one, especially once we go for Soak, which changes Ferrothorn's typing from Grass Steel to Pure Water. So now it won't have Stab. But then it just uses Curse. The plan was to switch to Retribution, who can now Toxic the Ferrothorn and stall it out. But the Curse makes things a little bit trickier. So I just stay in with Wrath and start going for Air Slashes. Ferrothorn goes for another Curse. And then on the next turn, he actually misses a Power Whip. So if Wrath manages to get a flinch or a critical hit with Air Slash on this next turn, she'll be able to kill Ferrothorn. But she gets neither, and then Ferrothorn retaliates with a Power Whip, knocking out Wrath. Sadly, this was always likely going to be a suicide mission. Otis thanks you for your service. Pain comes out and avenges his fallen teammate with a Choice Band Drain Punch. I kind of forgot that it wouldn't be super effective because of Soak, so I'm pretty lucky that this still managed to pick up the kill. 
Perserker comes out next, but we just use Drain Punch twice to knock it out. Perserker does get off a Throat Chop, so we aren't at full health when we take him down, but the recovery from Drain Punch gets us pretty close. Last is Rose's Kaparaja, but fortunately Choice Band Drain Punch makes this guy pretty easy to deal with. Rose goes for the Gigantamax, and then a Drain Punch hits it for a huge chunk of damage, bringing us to full health. It gets off a Max Mindstorm, but then a second Drain Punch gives us enough health back to survive a Max Quake on the next turn. So, one more Drain Punch causes the weirdly shaped cow to explode, which wins us the battle against the big boss. Then we gotta go to the top of the building and help Leon fight Eternatus. This thing is pretty scary, and you can't catch it, so I actually have to defeat it before it knocks out one of my Pokémon. Fortunately, Pain with an Assault Vest is able to tank a Dynamax Cannon, and then retaliate with a fairly strong Earth Power. Eternatus uses Flamethrower on the next turn, and then I go for a Dig, hoping that it'll do a bit more damage. But when we resurface, Eternatus hangs on with about 10%, so I gotta switch to Retribution, who takes no damage from a Cross Poison. I use Baneful Bunker for a little bit of recovery, just in case, and then on the next turn, Eternatus fires off a nasty Dynamax Cannon as we hit Hex for a smidge of damage. Okay, so then it's time for another Baneful Bunker for some Black Sludge recovery. Eternatus thankfully goes for a Flamethrower, which does crit, and then I use Recover. After a Baneful Bunker, we're back to full health. Then Eternatus just goes for another Flamethrower, and then a Critical Hit Hex knocks it out. Nice job, Retribution. A Critical Hit Dynamax Cannon there would have been really bad. After this, Eternatus turns into the Claw from Toy Story, so Hop joins me in for a max raid battle against it. After a few turns of not being able to hit it as it stores energy, Zacian and Zamazenta show up to help us out. The blue dog puts a sword in its mouth to raise its attack, and then the red dog puts on a shield that boosts its defense. Real useful against Eternatus, the special attacker. Well now it's a 4 on 1, and I decide to let Zacian and Zamazenta do the heavy lifting. Zacian starts off with a howl to boost everyone's attack, Zamazenta sets up a light screen, and then Eternatus fires off a huge Max Worm Wind into pain. So now everyone's attack is back to neutral. I go for a dig to avoid damage on the following turn, and then Hop helps out by having his goat lightly run into the giant hand for a bit of damage. On the next turn, Zacian uses a Behemoth Blade, which does good damage, and then Zamazenta uses a Behemoth Bash, which does slightly less good damage. Then Eternatus hits a massive Max Flare into Zamazenta, who tanks it like a champ, and I do some damage with Dig. Oh, and then Hop does a wee bit of damage as well. Good job, Hop! On the next turn, I switch to Apocalypse, and then Zacian does some more damage with Behemoth Blade. Zamasenta does some with Behemoth Bash, and then Eternatus hits a Max Wormwind on Apocalypse. And then there's Hop, who keeps on trucking away with double edges. I go for a Protect on the next turn, and then the Puppers fire off another Behemoth Blade and a Behemoth Bash, respectively, which leaves Eternatus with the tiniest fraction of health. This lets Eternatus use a Max Wormwind into Hop's Dubwool, who also survives with what looks like literally 1 HP. But 1 HP is just enough health for Hop and his Dubwool to fire off one last suicidal double edge, knocking out the mighty beast. If that isn't a beautiful end to Insecure Hop's arc, I don't know what is. But because I'm the main character, and of course I did most of the heavy lifting in that fight, I get to catch Eternatus. So I decide to use a Love Ball because I realized something during this challenge. You can't change the world with violence, or revenge, or scorn, or vengeance, or wrath, or Fred. No, the only force that will truly make a difference in this world is love. And love is what we must carry in our hearts every day of our lives. Anyways, let's go destroy this cocky cape-wearing bastard, why don't we? Leon's Pokémon are significantly higher leveled than the Pokémon we faced in the Championship Cup, so I decided to give him his own level cap. Not sure if that's standard, but whatever. His Charizard is at level 65, so after leveling everyone up, it's time for the final challenge of the fight. Leon leads Aegislash, and I lead Retaliation. I go for a Protect to see if Aegislash will switch to Blade form. He does. So on the next turn, I go for an Eerie Impulse to lower his special attack, and then Aegislash hits a Shadow Ball. Aegislash goes for a King Shield to switch back into Shield form, so our Skull doesn't hit. On the next turn, I go for a Protect as Aegislash switches back to Blade form and tries to go for a Sacred Sword. I go for a Scald, hoping for a Burn, but I don't get it, so Aegislash hits a Sacred Sword. Then I go for another Eerie Impulse as Aegislash uses King Shield to switch back into Shield form. Then I switch to Retribution, who shakes off a Sacred Sword. Then, of course, I set up two layers of Toxic Spikes, as Aegislash just hops around from Blade form to Shield form and does very little damage. But these Toxic Spikes are just a backup plan. I switch back to Retaliation as Aegislash goes for King Shield and switches back to Shield form. 
Then I hit a Scald, which does burn Aegislash, so a Sacred Sword does very little damage. Leon uses a full restore, so I hit Aegislash with another Scald. Then I decide that it's time to put an end to all this. I bring in Condemption as Aegislash goes for a King Shield, and then I click Shell Smash, which is a nasty move that doubles my attack, special attack, and speed, but lowers my defense and special defense. Or at least it should lower my defense and special defense, but thanks to holding a white herb, those stat drops get cleared. Aegislash then retaliates with a Sacred Sword, but Condemption tanks it pretty well. On the next turn, a Surf knocks out the Aegislash. Setting up on Aegislash was a little risky because a critical hit Shadow Ball would have definitely killed Condemption, but I did have contingency plans. But now that Condemption got off a of Shell Smash, she's uniquely poised to absolutely tear through the rest of Leon's team. His Rhyperior comes out and goes down to a Surf. Easy. Dragapult is next, but now we outspeed it and it goes down to two hits from an Icicle Spear. Third is Rillaboom, which also goes down to two Icicle Spears. Fifth is Haxorus, so three more hits from Icicle Spear bury it six feet under as well. And then last is Leon's, and apparently Game Freak's favorite Pokemon, Charizard. Leon Gigantamaxes his powerful Charizard and it bellows a mighty roar. But then we just instantly kill it with a Rock Blast. Thankfully that hit since Rock Blast does have 90% accuracy. But with that, we've won the battle and the run. Well, with that, we've come to the end of the Team Seas Challenge. With six deaths, I'll be happily donating $600 to the campaign, which will remove 600 pounds of trash from our lakes, rivers, and oceans. Every dollar donated helps clean up trash that we're responsible for putting there, so any small amount that you're able to donate goes a long way to keeping our planet clean. Thank you so much to Mark Rober and Mr. Beast for starting this campaign. And thanks as always to all of you for watching. As we near the one year anniversary of my first video on YouTube, it's all still pretty surreal to me. All the support means so much, and I really don't say it often enough. So thanks everyone. If you enjoyed watching, please like the video and subscribe. Or don't, I don't know. But I do know that you should follow me on Twitter and Twitch to keep up with streams of my future challenges, and you should also join the Flag on HG community discord, where you can discuss nuzlocking and make recommendations for future challenges. The link is in the description. Stay tuned for more nuzlocke videos, and until then, remember to always, always, always play around the critical hit.